Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the new screensavers is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. The new Screensavers is brought to you by Atlassian. Unleash your team's potential with collaborative software tools like HipChat and Jira that will enable you to work and communicate better together. Visit Atlassian.com to learn more. Stucknets and Zero Days the Movie, a pinball controller for your Oculus Rift, and the Tesla of baby seats. Live from the Twitch studios in beautiful downtown Petaluma, it's the new Screensavers. I'm Ron Richards. Hey, welcome back. Thank good you. It's good you. to be back. Yeah, Hosting definitely. All about Android yes. and yeah. comic book maven, and he's obviously a so. fan of Love and Rockets. Mm -hmm. One of the best you, comics ever. Yeah. Do you take an opportunity to, when you're on the show, to plug your favorite? No, it's pretty much whichever's clean. It's whatever <laughs> T-shirts on top of the pile. So, I kind of yeah. know what you mean. Though. I wish there was some thought behind it, but it was literally just okay. I'll wear this one today. So yeah. And uh, and, <laughs> and and thank you, by the way, to uh, Jason from uh, Buena Park, California, for doing that. He and his son are here. His son was going to do it. Yeah, chickened out. It's tough. A little bright lights, tough. camera. It's, yeah. it's hard. <laughs> yeah, it's great. His son grew up in Japan. Oh, cool. Speaks uh, fluent Japanese, but he also uh, speaks English because his dad's American. So mm -hmm. he's got the best of both. That's like I wish I spoke. Don't you wish you uh, spoke another language? I, I speak a little Italian, but not enough to uh, just enough to get me in trouble. Ron so, Ricardo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hey, we got a great show for <laughs> you. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to talk to the guy who discovered Stuxnet. Uh, yeah. And talk a little bit about viruses and Zero Days, which is a new Alex Gibney movie. Yes. I uh, can't wait to see. Cool stuff. Uh, Tony has a review of a baby seat. You know, he's got a new baby. <laughs> I do, yeah. Tony and, and you need a seat. This is the craziest seat you ever saw. <laughs> it's Bluetooth enabled. Right. Yeah. What do you need Bluetooth in a baby well, seat? Everything, everything's smart devices now. I'm not surprised at all that the baby seat is smart. I can't wait to see somebody hack the baby seat. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll find out about that. And, uh, but the best part is, and yeah. uh, you're kind of familiar with this. Yes, I am. Yeah. So my buddy Jeremy from my pinball league uh, built this minute. amazing. You're in a pinball I, league? I am in a pinball league, yeah, in San Francisco. Yep. Is that like a bowling league? Uh, kind of, yeah. We meet, meet every couple of weeks, play pinball. And there's Do you have tournaments? And, yeah, tournaments and playoffs and all that stuff. Yeah, it's a good time. A couple of, a couple of our league members are in the audience, so yeah. So, uh, do you we, have a monogram pinball case? No, we have hoodies. We have our own. We, oh, good. Yeah, so, but anyway, but what's um, the name of the league? Uh, it's called San Francisco Pinball Department. So good. SFPD. Oh, SFPD. SFPins.org. SFPins.org. I like so. it. But uh, yeah, so my buddy Jeremy from my league uh, built an amazing Oculus VR controller for VR pinball. And, and it is, it is. I was playing with it before the show. It's yeah. really cool. It's very cool. Very, very now, cool. Now, I, I didn't know you were a professional pinball I'm player. I'm hardly professional. I have no, I've not earned any money yet, so I'm still <laughs> amateur. Okay. But uh, some of my friends are professionals, and uh, I, I'm, I'm a middling pinball player at best. Jeremy is much better than I am. So. I can't, I can't yeah. wait. Well, this is going to be fun. Wait till you see this thing. Yeah. It's beautiful, it's very cool. too. Very, very cool. And I think the, the person who made the cabinet is yes well. yeah christopher right yep, yep. That's so, nice. yeah yeah so right. a team effort so so we start as usual with the week's news of course uh the big story and i'm still digesting it britain's exit from the eu and we yep. don't even know what that means to the tech community it might mean that if you're uh, selling computers out of the U.S. You have to make new trade agreements with Britain as opposed to just one agreement with the EU. But right. that, that, you know, tomorrow, Ian Thompson, who's actually British, will be on the show uh, on Twit, and we'll get him to explain. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of economic for startups and for companies, crazy. companies that are operating in England as well as in Europe, how they, right. how they work. It's, it's going to change everything. Yeah. So, yeah. so well, uh, you know, this is going to be fascinating, but we'll talk about it tomorrow on Twit. Yeah. Um, I was interested in what you thought uh, of this because because of course, as host of All About Android, you deal with Android phones, but yep. Apple apparently, and this is only rumor, yep. although as we get closer and closer to the release of the iPhone 7, rumor seems to be more and more accurate that Apple's gonna drop the headphone port. Yep. 
Motorola just did the same yeah, thing. The Moto Z dropped it. Uh, no more headphone jack, as we know it. The little, uh, what is the 1.44 millimeter? Uh, the phono, the, the mini phono, phono that jack. we're all used to, yeah. that we all grew up with. Uh, yeah, the Moto Z dropped it in favor of uh, either a Bluetooth device or some sort of or a dongle of some sort. So they have um, a Type C port on the Moto Z, yeah, which means yeah. you could get digital audio out of the Type C right, port. Right. Then I said, I, I personally, I love USB C. I love Type C. I think it's a great new. It's it's a, a truly it's a great upgrade from previous versions of USB, but I hate the idea of having a dongle for a headphone jack and for a power cord and things like that. But that said, I'm kind of a convert to Bluetooth. I've got a great Bluetooth speakers. I, I, I'm looking for the right Bluetooth head, headphones. That's all well but, and good. Yeah. But why would you... Well, Neil I. Patel wrote in the, the Verge, taking the headphone jack off phones yep. is user hostile and stupid. <laughs> he says, have some dignity, Apple. And his point is that Apple's doing this to, to simulate innovation. It's right. like, we don't have anything really new well, to do. And that's something that we've talked about a lot on All About Android, is that in all the years of iterations between the phones, we're seeing less and less innovation on the hardware than the phones yeah. themselves. The phones are... A rectangle with a screen, right. with speakers, and there's really not a lot. That's why I'm really excited about what's going on on the Android space about a lot of the expandable and modular stuff. Motorola with the pogo pins on the back with their new phones, so you can snap on a speaker yeah, or snap on a battery. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that's really interesting. Um, I see the argument for ditching the headphone jack as just an excuse for innovation, but I also see it as it's kind of an anti. I mean, I'm playing, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Um, it's kind of an antiquated interface. I mean, it's the it's the same jack that's been we've been used since the, what the 60s or 70s. Right? Well, and that's what John Gruber, who is of course an Apple fan, yeah. uh, but writes Daring Fireball, which is one of the preeminent Apple Great blogs. Blog. Blog. He responds to this. He says, uh, "Well, Apple's done it before. Remember, Apple took the uh, floppy disk out of yep. the iMac, and that was prescient. The floppy disk was dying." Yeah. Um, but I have to say, the idea that the iPhone would require you to have either a proprietary lightning dongle, and yeah. Apple owns the lightning Which port, it's not like, like Type-C, yeah. so you could make the argument maybe Apple's doing this because they can An make accessory money. play, yeah. Or yeah. specialized headphones. Philips already makes them. Beats already makes yeah. lightning port headphones, but those are going to be more expensive. Apple might say, oh, well, the quality will be better because the digital to analog converter won't be inside the phone and those are admittedly cheap DACs in, in all the phones right. right now but you could get a better DAC external to the phone you'd still yeah. need a DAC at some right. point um, they it's not because it's gonna make it thinner or lighter or anything or cheaper maybe there's more room a little yeah. more room for a battery I don't know I mean there is a counterpoint argument that says this is a perfected piece of technology that works so don't change it yeah right? I don't <laughs> feel like it's in the same category as yeah. a floppy disk yeah, yeah floppy yeah. disks were being superseded by CD-ROMs and hard drives and USB keys Apple put a USB port on the iMac yeah. said you don't need a floppy anymore that I kind of understand yeah. But this is mature technology that's inexpensive. Everybody, yep. but everybody, has some form of headphone that uses the headphone jack. Are you going to obsolete all of those? That's crazy. I mean, a great use case is I was, I was in New York last week, and I forgot my, my running headphones, and I wanted to go running. I used my phone. I just went into uh, You could Walgreens. buy it at a gas I bought, station. Yeah, I bought $8 pair of right. earbuds, and I went running, and it was fine. If I, needed, if I needed to buy the dongle and a headphone right. that attaches to the dongle or buy another Bluetooth set of headphones, that's going to get expensive. That's, and there's an annoying. Apple tax, absolutely, yeah. on Anything yeah. that's going to use the lightning port, Apple's going to make 10, 20, yeah. whatever bucks. Yeah. Um, I, you know, but they I should point out that this isn't a done deal. It's just a rumor. It could be that Apple's listening right now saying, what do they think of this? And people are going to, at Apple are going to say, yeah, 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 maybe we better not do that. If they, if, I mean, if we're, where are we? We're in June. If the announcement's coming in the beginning of September, I mean, it's, the, the, close. it's getting close to that ship sailing. Like, they got to start making the they're devices. They're making them. They're yeah, going to make exactly. 100 million of them by the end of the year. And they got to start now. And the thing is, they're going to get up on stage and make wonderful announcements. <sighs> they need something to announce. You know, if they don't have anything to talk about, it's going to be a real boring keynote. So. so this is a real test of the devotion of iPhone users. Yeah. How devoted are you to the Apple platform and admittedly with their announcements of iOS 10 and uh, OS, Mac OS Sierra and the integration of the watch and the phone and the desktop and the there's a real advantage to being all Apple but how devoted are you to that ecosystem are you willing to give up your headphone jack especially as there's a wow. multitude of Android phones with headphone jacks that you can all purchase and try out and they're wonderful it is gutsy <laughs> of Motorola to do that it is too. gutsy I mean, of Motorola they don't, but, they don't but, have the market cloud app well but Motorola is like I 
I mentioned with the with the modular phones, they're scrambling to do anything that differentiates them. Right. Um, and the the new line of phones with the Moto Z is, is is just exemplifying that. It's just showing that they're they're throwing stuff against the wall to see if it works because they're in a position to take those risks. Apple is a market leader. I mean, but the question is, is that so are people not going to buy the the new iPhone? Of course they are. They're sheep. That's what they do. So they're they're going to complain about it and they're going to complain about it on Twitter, but they're still going to buy it. I think uh. this is, you know, one of those moments that could shake the tree a little bit, and some Apple users might fall out of that tree and become Android users. Mm -hmm. It might be just enough of a hump at that point. Mm -hmm. There is very strong Android hardware out there that competes head on with Apple. In some cases, is better. Yeah, come on in, the water's fine. <laughs> it's, it's great. Good. It's just all it's about really Android every Tuesday at five thirty on Twitter Network. <laughs> and, and by the way, in, in a kind of related thing, Apple has also pulled the Thunderbolt display. Apple yep. is saying. One of two possibilities. They may have a new display, uh, which they want to sell out all the Thunderbolt right. displays. Or, and this is what I think, I think they're doing the same thing to external displays as they're doing to the headphone port. I yeah. think they're saying, you don't need it anymore. Yeah. Uh, what they did say is there are plenty of other companies making excellent displays. It's be it says, we're discontinuing the Apple Thunderbolt display. It'll be available through Apple.com while supplies last. There are a number, this is the quote, of great third-party options available for Mac users. Yeah. I'm, here's my guess. They, they see dis external displays, A, as a shrinking category. Yeah. They make built-in displays. They do make two computers, the uh, Mac Mini yeah. and the Mac Pro, that need external displays, but I doubt either of them is big sellers. Right. And I think they've also said displays are commoditized now. There's nothing really, just like phones, to distinguish them. I just had I uh, one of my remember years ago those Dell monitors were so cheap and they were great so I had I had two of those 20 inch monitors and I bought them like six years ago they recently died so I'm like all right I need to buy a new monitor I have a Mac Mini so I need an external monitor went to Best Buy I got a 25 inch widescreen for like 120 bucks that's I a mean, business yeah. Apple doesn't want to be in. exactly exactly there's no there's no value in having a high priced external monitor where wow. the the key differentiator is the Thunderbolt connector uh, it doesn't give them anything and I haven't seen anybody buying those I you know I don't know and none of my friends have them I haven't heard any be like, oh, I got this great monitor. That's what I always listen for, to see what the reaction of people after they make a purchase. And so I wasn't surprised by this news at all. But what makes me wonder is, will you know, to resuscitate the rumor of the Apple TV, you know, the, what does this say about Apple's display business? And, and will we never, ever, ever see an Apple te television? I think Apple has changed yeah. its focus I agree. quite yeah. a bit. Uh, and there's, you know, one of the things they've always done very well is to cut Yep. anything that isn't really core and central to their business. And I think this is a reasonable decision. And if it's not selling, it's a business decision. And they, they, were, they were much more expensive yeah. than the comparable displays, right? Yeah. One last story. I just want to mention this. Uh, it's a big thing at EFF.org. We always talk about EFF. Um, by one, one, maybe two votes, this, the Senate rejected the FBI's request for warrantless access to your browser history. But it was that close by one or two votes, which means it's going to happen again. Mitch McConnell switched his vote at the last minute, but he is he's the Senate majority leader. He has pitched a motion to reconsider the vote. Uh, John McCain added this. We should just, you know, name names here. Senator John McCain, if you're in Arizona, remember this. He added this to the Commerce, Justice, and Science Appropriations Bill, a budget bill, yeah. last week. And oh, by the way, we won't need uh, we don't need uh, warrants to look at your browser history anymore. <sighs> Folks, you got to pay attention to this stuff. Yep. EFF.org/action. They're all over this. M let your Congress critter know we're coming to election. You have to you have to know who your Congress people are, who your senators are, and call their offices and let them know how you feel. Uh, John Oliver on HBO a couple weeks ago had a great uh, episode going over financial like 401ks and investments, and there's a whole bunch of legislation going on that's affecting that. And unless you call your congressman and let them know, congressperson, he, let them know how you feel, they won't vote on your you know behalf. Not that they're voting on our behalf. I anyway, think a preponderance a of a, a geeks and techies. Uh, either are libertarian or have kind of given up because government seems so flawed. Yep. And we, we like environments that are flawless. We yep. expect things to be rational. That's why we like tech. But we can't, you can't give up but because let's listen to what this amendment would do. It would broaden, it would, if the amendment became law, federal agents would not need a court order to access your phone logs, your email records, your cell site data, your location data, your browsing history, all of that information. This is our privacy. On yeah. your phone, all they'd have to do is go to your carrier and say, can you just give us all that stuff? And by the way, we don't need a warrant, so just give it to us now. Yeah. Um, that is 
terrifying. It's, um, it's horrible. And, and the thing is, that, and the great example, and I know there's been a lot of conversation in the country recently about gun, gun control and things like that. Um, you look at a political organization like the NRA, who is only 4 million people, uh, and they are effective because they pick up the phone and call. They show up. It's, they are active. It's easy. And that's why, yeah. unfortunately, that they have such power. But it's easy. It's easy. All you got to do is If you get care. Up. So, yeah, exactly. Just, just pick up the phone and call your Congress critter yep. or write a mass snail mail. Email's not as good yep. uh, because they need to identify you as a constituent. That's why it's best to call the office and they'll say, okay, where do you live? And they'll, and they'll make a note of that. And they tally those phone calls and those carry a lot of weight so please the, use the, those. nothing frustrates me more about our peop, our group of people our subculture than by the sense that just posting how you feel on twitter is it's actual enough. civil action it's not enough it's not enough so uh you got to be active and if you want to see any nothing change to happen. Yeah. tweet speaking of tweet in congress yep. the sit down uh, in the what, what do they call that? Uh, sit in. So sit in. Yeah. So uh, in the House of Representatives, led by John Lewis, who is a, a legendary congressman who led who led a lot of the sit-ins. There he is in this photo. He was right a there civil rights civil, uh, activist who did yep, he, sit -ins, sit sit-ins for civil rights. He's now doing it uh, for gun control. Yep. But what was interesting is because Congress had uh, adjourned for the day, C-SPAN, which doesn't own the cameras. Yep. lost its video feed from Congress. And the reason this is a text story, however you come down on the, on the issue, is yep. several members of the House pick, put up, take out their phones. Some of them didn't even know how to do it. They yeah, had to have staffers show them how to use Periscope. <laughs> yep. They started Periscoping it. C-SPAN picked up. There were at least seven feeds, yep. video feeds out of there from members of Congress. C-SPAN continued broadcasting. I guess you were saying the Periscope failed? Yeah, so so what happened was, so this, I thought this was all fascinating because it turns out there's no staff of C-SPAN at the House of Representatives no. at the Capitol. They are just security cameras right. and they work gavel to gavel. Right. So when they, oh, and then they turn on. So when this happened, uh, the staffers gave them their phones and they turned on Periscope. Unfortunately, due to connections issues or who knows, whatever, Periscope was crashing, so um, C-SPAN carried the Periscope feeds, but then switched over to Facebook Live once a lot of the Congress folks... Big victory for Facebook Live. Facebook Live stayed stayed up, and that's what C-SPAN was broadcasting for the majority of the sit-in through the through the night, uh, which is just kind of amazing and shows, you know, the power of these live streaming tools, uh, what they can do in terms of these moments when stuff happens. And, I mean, I, 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 couldn't, be I couldn't believe that C-SPAN wasn't covering this talk with their about, cameras. Like, talk uh, about yeah. democratizing. Yeah. Uh, this is the power, and when we're seeing now, Twitter's gonna is doing live video. Yep. Periscope is a Twitter company, but Twitter's also doing more with yep. video. Uh, Facebook's doing it with Facebook Live. Yep. This is gonna. YouTube has announced that soon everybody you won't have to have a special brand of smartphone. Right. Everybody will be able to stream via their YouTube yep. account live. This is a revolution. There's Periscope. You can yeah, see because of the hearts. The hearts. <laughs> the hearts coming up. This is a revolution. This is amazing. Yeah. And something to be celebrated, I think. We are, we are, we, uh, democracy is difficult. Democracy is tough, and it was great to see this kind of action get take place. I just hope that we see results. That's yeah. all, especially right. after everything going on. So. Anyway, that's the uh, top, boy, there's a lot, uh, top Welcome. stories uh, today. And I thank you, Ron Richards, always good for a conversation. Now I want to talk about malware, shall we? Joining us, Eric Chen. He's technical director at Symantec's Security Technology and Response Division. With him, Liam Omerhu, who is director and secure of security and technology response group at Symantec. Liam's in Ireland. Where are you located, Eric? I'm in Culver City. All right. So Symantec's all over the world with this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, you know, attacks happen all over the world at any time of the day. So uh, we always have people on and working. Stuxnet was an interesting story because I think it was the first time we saw a virus that looked like it was created by a government entity, right? Yeah, it, it was definitely one of the first. You know, at that time when Stuxnet came out, we had things that, you know, we felt were at sort of the level of the nation state. But, you know, Stuxnet really had all the makings that it was definitely a nation state. I mean, who else is going in there and trying to basically blow up I Iran's nuclear centrifuges? How did, how did it get discovered? Because what uh, originally it was intended only to affect those machines in Iran. Yeah, that's, that's the interesting part is that the actors who were behind it got super aggressive and basically the way they coded it is that it can spread to any windows machine anywhere in the world as long as your machine is on connected to the internet you can get infected with stuxnet now nothing more is potentially going to happen unless you happen to be hosting a bunch of nuclear centrifuges oh in other words stuxnet yeah. might be on your machine but it's not going to speed up your centrifuge it's, it's got, yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm sorry, it's just going to use your machine to spread to more Windows machines, more Windows machines, oh. in the hopes that eventually it gets into the right place. Well, part of the problem was that these centrifuges in the uranium enrichment facilities were air-gapped, right? Right. So they had to leap the air gap somehow. That's right, and, and that's exactly why they were so aggressive. Um, they use multiple means of spreading, and one of the key means they use of spreading, which is likely the way they jumped into the air gap, was they would spread to USB keys. So you have to imagine, in these air gap networks, there's, there's never an air gap network that's 100% air gap, right? Developers got to get their code in, they got to get logs out, and they typically do that by bringing USB keys in and out. Right. And and for those watching who don't know, air gap means it's a it's a machine not hooked up to the network, not hooked up to the yeah. internet. Because so. you'd have to be crazy if you're running uranium uranium enrichment centrifuges right. to hook them up to the internet. That would be nuts. Well, you want to watch your cat videos while the <laughs> the centrifuges are going. <laughs> oh, so I, I mean, I might point out that there are <laughs> machines all over, including hospitals and important medical uh, equipment that in fact are infected now with Stuxnet because right. they're on the internet. Right. Right. Not to mention ransomware and, and other things. Should we even... Now, by the way, do we know what government created Stuxnet? I mean, we can uh, hypothesize, obviously. We don't know. I mean, there's been, there's been reporting by journalists that uh, claim that it was a uh, U.S. and Israeli operation. Yeah. But the, co the code doesn't tell us that. And we would expect that because, of course, uh, one of the goals of is the Israeli government, and certainly one of our goals, is to keep Iran from becoming a nuclear power. And this one of the things that's, that's covered in the film actually is, is, why, is about uh, why governments are not talking about this. Uh, why, why, are, why is all this happening? Essentially, we're moving towards cyber war and we have these cyber weapons and there's no rules around that. So a lot of the film covers, uh, you know, government officials not talking about Stuxnet and not talking about cyber war and ask the question, you know, why is that? Why are we not able to talk about this and understand what are the rules here? Yeah, let's mention this movie. This is another Alex Gibney uh, film. It's called Zero Days. Were you guys uh, involved in the production of the movie? We were interviewed for it. Uh, yeah. So Alex, Alex came out and interviewed both of us for about two days. So the issue uh, with Stuxnet uh, is that, in fact, it took advantage, as uh, I would guess, because of uh, Gibney's name in the film, of a, it was a zero-day flaw. Is that, is that correct? That's right. Actually, it had multiple zero-day flaws. That there was actually four Microsoft Windows zero days inside of Stuxnet. And just for some context, I mean, the vast majority of the malware we see doesn't have any zero days inside of it. And if you had one zero day inside, then that would be big news. And that's sort of how it came on the radar of security companies to begin with. Um, and so at most, we saw threats with one zero day. And here we had one that had four zero days inside. So this whole thing was sort of revolutionary in the malware space. What's a zero day? A zero day basically is a vulnerability, a bug in, your, in some software that you use that allows uh, a threat to basically get on your machine and run on your machine without you having to do anything, right? So typically people talk about malicious software and they say, oh, I got to go visit this website or I have to download this email and run this attachment or open this file. If you have a zero day, the threat or an attacker can get on your machine without you having to do anything. And so now, so you guys were somewhat involved in, I mean, Symantec was involved in discovering this. Uh, how, did, how did that all break down? How, uh, how, did, how did the discovery occur? Yeah, so what happened was originally some machines in Belarus uh, got infected with them. And actually a Belarusian security company found that the first samples and saw that it had some sort of zero day inside. They, they couldn't even confirm it. I mean, the code was so complex at that point. And all the security companies around the world, we all share samples and indicators of attacks and things like that. It just tried to generally help protect the world. And they did so. And when we got the sample, we began to just rip it apart and realize there was much more here than just this single zero day. Gibney, in the film, uh, discovered something called Nitro Zeus. What is that? Yeah, well, what Nitro Zeus is, is that basically... Um, you know, you have actors that are doing what we call staging. So they basically put in their implants or malicious software or backdoor code or get credentials into networks all over the place, in critical infrastructure, potentially in an entire country, and they just let them sit there and wait. And then the day there is some sort of geopolitical event that occurs where you want to basically flip the switch, you do so because all your implants are all in the right place. And then you potentially you bring down the power grid, you know, you shut down the water, etc. Gibney's contention was that uh, Stuxnet was in fact part of this Nitro Zeus, that this was uh, a sleeper malware, I guess, that waiting for Iran to make progress in its nuclear enrichment program. And was it triggered as, or accidentally, or was it, was it triggered as it had intended to be triggered? Stuxnet. Stux, Stuxnet definitely wasn't accidental. Um, yeah. you know, <laughs> Stuxnet 
was basically a totally autonomous piece of code. Um, that so was you can't control it once you release it, right? No, it's still out there today. You right. have machines getting infected today still. So that sounds like a pretty stupid way to <laughs> go, go about it. And I, I, I'm not going to fill in the blanks for you. We, every, we all should watch Zero Days. But my suspicion is that governments don't want to talk about this because they realize what a risky proposition this all is, right? And cyber warfare can really bite you in the butt. Yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, America itself is uh, very exposed to cyber warfare because it's so interconnected. Uh, you know, everything that uh, that happens in in the U.S. in particular is is all online as much as possible, even uh, industrial control systems. So going out and uh, launching these sorts of cyber weapons, uh, while that's good on an offensive uh, from an offensive point of view, you have to be thinking defensively as well. And America is very exposed. One of the uh, stories, in, and BuzzFeed has the article uh, that uh, is proposed in this film, is that originally Stuxnet uh, was intended for the U.S. to actually keep a lid on Israel. Israel created a more virulent version of <laughs> Stuxnet and released it into the wild, and that actually really upset the United States. Is, is that credible to you? Well, we see it with, with Stuxnet, we actually, there was a configuration file associated with the, the malware. And inside the configuration file, there was things like how virulent it could be. So how many computers could it spread to? How many USB drives could it infect? And how long would it spread for? And what we saw with different versions of Stuxnet was that it got continuously more aggressive. So it started off only spreading for 30 days, and then they moved it up to 90 days, and then up to 180 days. And also, it could in, in, initially it could infect only three USB drives, and then they moved <laughs> that up to five and 10. So it definitely got, we have, we have technical data that backs up that story. Yeah. Wow. So this is a six-year-old story. What's going on today? Are you seeing in your research labs similar nation-state attacks? There was Flame, FlameNet, right, or Flame? Flame and Dooku and, and Gauss. Dooku. Yeah. Yeah. It actually, since that time, since uh, we've seen Stuxnet, at the time there was maybe one or two operations we thought were being controlled by governments, and now it's since then it's just exploded. So oh, now we're right. tracking about a hundred groups. Uh, that are 100 attacks ongoing that are uh, launched by what we think of governments. Well, yeah, and, that, and that's the big kind of, you know, the question is that, you know, clearly Iran is going to feel like they were attacked, and so why wouldn't they counter with an attack? Plus there's the continuing threat of whatever's going on in North Korea and China, and, you know, it's, it, there's a whole level of cyber warfare that's going on that we're not even really aware of. And so well, and unlike great. nuclear weapons, the knowledge to create these kinds of weaponized mm -hmm. malware is fairly widespread, right? Everybody's got their hackers. Yeah, yeah everyone, definitely. Everyone has their hackers. But, um, you know, there's probably a difference between doing something like getting on a network and, let's say, wiping machine, deleting all your data, and, and sort of bringing down centrifuges. You think about the, the Stuxnet operation, you know, there was more than just a, a cyber component. They had to have on-the-ground spies that, you know, somehow stole the designs for these centrifuges. They had to steal centrifuges so they could test them out, you know, to make sure this thing would work. Um, but... Definitely, we have governments today going in and, and just trying to do things like, for example, bring down the power grid. Uh, we saw that in December in the Ukraine, for example. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a, to me at least, when I, when I read about this stuff, there's a difference between, you know, viruses and worms that are, you know, building botnets or, or getting access or, or accessing financial systems. But Stuxnet is an example of a worm that is actually looking to do something in the physical world to invade the computers and stop these centrifuges in Iran. Who's to say that somebody doesn't do it back to us that affects the traffic lights or our right. power plants or amusement parks or, you know, like all these things that are controlled via computers. Are, vi are viable targets. Stuxnet was targeting some specific controllers right. by Siemens in these. But, but could a bad guy get the code, the Stuxnet code, and, and weaponize it to distribute ransomware? I mean, is there something in there that they could look at and say, oh, that's a good way to do that? It's, it's more about the idea than the actual code. Taking okay. the code and repurposing it is quite tricky. Okay. It's, not, it's not impossible, but it is definitely quite challenging. And at, the, at that point, you'd probably be better off just to start writing your own code from scratch. <laughs> it's, not like, it's, more, it's not like there's it's really not, a shortage of kits that you can go on the Internet and buy, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. It's more about the idea that you can, you can actually do this. It's possible. It's possible to attack 
physical machines right. via code. And there's yeah. multiple ways to air do that. Air-gapped physical machines, yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. And actually, the air gap is very interesting because the, the air gap forced the attackers to embed the entire payload inside of one malware. And we, for, for advanced attacks, we don't often see that. So when we got our hands on Stuxnet, we, we always knew if we just kept on analyzing it, we would eventually get all of the details out of it. Ah. And whereas with, with other attacks, they may leave the payload out and they will only deliver the payload to one particular victim and it may even be encrypted for that particular victim. So your chances of analyzing the entire attack are very slim. That's why I'm very interested in Flame. Flame is really sophisticated in the sense that it's modular, it's uh, self-encrypting, it's very difficult, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's very difficult for you guys to figure out what Flame's doing. That, that's right, that's right. And we're seeing that everywhere now. Everywhere now we see these frameworks where basically right. the attackers can write plugins and they can deliver the specific plugins to the specific machines at the specific time, and they have you know multiple stages, and each stage is encrypted. Only the very first tiny stage is not. And so, um, in order to recover them all, you basically have to find all the victims in the world. And even then, it's possible that you haven't got all the plugins and possibilities. Have you have you actually found the flame loader? Wasn't that one of the issues? Was it would self destruct after it loaded the payload? Yeah, yeah. So its first delivery mechanism basically would deliver sort of this very small component onto your machine. And that first delivery mechanism would just simply disappear. Mm. And that's very smart of the attackers because typically those delivery mechanisms happen through, you know, zero days, what we talked about earlier. And zero days are pretty finite. And so if they leave that zero day on the machine, it becomes exposed and then people can patch against it. So they can't be, you know, hit by that zero a day right. again. By keeping it hidden and always so deleting smart. it, then less chance of recovery. You're in an interesting field, Eric and uh, Liam, and this is constantly changing. It's getting, it's getting wilder and wilder. From our point of view as users, should we assume that there may be, that there, I mean, look, I do all the normal things to protect right. myself. I update regularly. I make sure, you know, I... Security patches. Sec and all this stuff. But can we, I mean, is, do you think that these, these viruses are endemic, like they're out there everywhere? Should we assume that we are infected, in other words? I don't know if you should assume you're infected. They're definitely out there everywhere. If you don't follow some basic, you know, uh, security practices, then you probably should assume you're infected. But yeah. look, if you, if you keep to, you know, to the safe places of the Internet, make sure you're using security software, update and patch yourself, you know, you, you put a pretty high hurdle. Remember... Attackers are going after the low-hanging fruit. There's many, many users right. out there who don't even follow the basics, right. and they'll more than happy go after them first. You just want to put a hurdle to raise the cost of basically there, in, in is, getting your machines. There are plenty of people running Windows XP without a router, just <laughs> sitting on the internet, <laughs> just directly. Just hum along. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, is, is the best advice to avoid Windows at this point? I mean, I feel like. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah I, that's I, you know. Not because you're necessarily safer. I'm running Linux here, but because it's the, but because it's a smaller uh, yep. attack surface exactly. and it's less it's less uh, valuable. It is true that, uh, for example, Macs uh, were not attacked really for the last maybe five years ago. They were hardly ever attacked, and since they've since Macs have become more popular, we're starting to see an increase in attacks against Macs. Uh, two years ago, we saw a threat that infected a million Macintoshes in one month. So uh, yeah, so it, it it is it definitely does tie into the popularity of the system that you're using. If your system is less popular, there may be reasons why it's less popular. But if it's less popular, then the attackers may not go after it uh, as quickly. <laughs> and that's the scary thing. I mean, I'm a I'm a OS X, I'm a Mac user. User, and I admittedly have a false sense of security, like, oh, nothing's going to happen to mine. And so you, you, can't, you always got to keep your guard up no matter what machine you're on and make yeah. sure that you're doing the patches and stuff. I think Apple's updated. doing some really smart yeah. things under the hood to, to, no. to keep us safe. And frankly, the vectors have changed away from operating systems to other stuff that we use to get online, including things like Adobe Flash, yeah. uh, which aren't being patched as assiduously <laughs> and as effectively. Yeah. So the movie comes out July 8th. You can get it on iTunes. It'll be in theaters as well. It's called Zero Days. You can find out more at zerodaysfilm.com. Alex Gibney, Academy Award winner. Uh, and he really, I think, uncovered some fascinating yeah. stuff. And I can't wait uh, to see this. Scary stuff. Yeah, yeah. It really looks yeah. interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Liam, it really is a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for the good work you do to protect all of us. Thank Thanks you. We appreciate it. Uh, really interesting. Eric Chen, Technical Director of Semantic Security Technology and Response Division, and uh, Liam Omorku, who is a Director of uh, Security Tech, uh, Technology and Response Group at Symantec. That's, that's the kind of job where you show up just waiting to see what happens. Like, like you know, like, there's so much... It must you know. feel like at some point, like it's yeah. like lemmings, like they're, yep. like I can't, it's a locusts. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah.
Uh, coming up, we're going to do a uh, we're going to talk about protecting your privacy with full drive encryption. But first, Brian Burnett, this is a good tip. Watch this: two ways to recover deleted files in Windows 10. Brian Burnett here, and I'm going to give you a little tip in Windows 10 in case you lose some files. Now, we're all pretty familiar with if you delete a file, it goes to the recycling bin, and you can just pull it out of there and put it back on your desktop. But what happens if you empty your recycling bin and there's something in there that you wanted? You can download a program like Recover, and it will scan through your recycling bin and give you the files. Now, through process of elimination, you can figure out what file it was that got deleted. They don't have the former file name, but you can find a .wav, which is the file I was looking for to recover. You can also use it to scan your entire computer. Now, what happens if you run into a situation where you delete a big file, you know, like eight gigs or something bigger than that, Sometimes you'll get prompted with deleting the file immediately, and it will skip the process of going to your recycle bin. If that happens, what you can do is make a new folder, rename it to what the old folder's name was, and then go into the properties, go to previous versions, and do a restore. And Windows will restore your folder back to what it was. And as you can see, I have all my pictures and videos back. So that's just a quick tip if you ever uh, delete something from the recycling bin that you didn't mean to. I think a lot of people don't, don't know about Windows 10 versioning, and that, that is really, really useful. Fascinating. Yeah, shadow copy. Yeah, look, All at, right. look at Brian with a tip. There you go. Yeah, yeah look Brian. at that guy. Look at that oh, guy. Brian. He's right. good looking, but who knew he was that <laughs> no. smart too, right? All right. Uh, <laughs> hey, our show, today, our show today is brought to you by Atlassian. Now, if you're in the business of development, of teams, of working on projects in the tech industry. I'm sure you know the name Atlassian. We use it like crazy here because we've always got projects going. When we wanted to redesign the website, that was my first experience of Jira, which is a great tool for keeping track of who's doing what, what the project is, what the different tasks are. It makes it easy to take a very complex project and make it in small chunks that are easy to digest. G Jira is J-I-R-A and it is amazing. We, I didn't realize, we still use it by the way, we're using it in, in our app development. Uh, we also, I didn't realize this, use Confluence. This is another Atlassian product. Uh, it's designed to create and share content, to organize results, to keep team members up to speed. And we use it to document our equipment, our work processes. We use Jira for managing our vendors. And you know what we really use like crazy is HipChat. In fact, we have kind of almost a mantra, put it on hip chat. We, anytime we're working with a new team, for instance, we've got a new studio in process. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of teams. There's contractors, there's engineers, there's ISPs. Put it in hip chat, that way everybody's on the same page. It's both synchronous and asynchronous. So it's like a messaging system, but you can always go back in time. It's got a great search. It also has really powerful integrations into all the tools we use. I'll give you an example. Uh, we use something called Panopta, which keeps an eye on our servers. If a server is slow or down, Panopta is a member of the hip chat, our engineering hip chat. It'll send us a message saying server XYZ is down or is slow. We can act on it right away. You get the notifications. It's hip chat is incredible. There finally, there's, I don't know if we use this. I, if anybody would be, it would be Patrick Delahanty, our programmer, Bitbucket, which lets you test and review and manage code in real time. Look, if you've ever worked on a team in technology, you probably know the name Atlassian. If you don't, you could try it for free. Go to Atlassian.com and see how Jira and Confluence and HipChat and Bitbucket give your team everything you need to organize, discuss, and complete shared work. We could not do what we do without Atlassian. Atlassian, helping teams everywhere team up to create what's next. We thank Atlassian not only for our support, uh, for their support of the new screensavers, but for making it possible. I'm telling you, without HipChat, I think this whole place is we wouldn't know what the hell's going on. Uh, let's do it. It's time for a call for help. On the line from Stony Creek, Ontario, Ed. Hello, Ed. Hello, Leo. How are you? Nice to see you. Say hello to Ron Richards hey, Ed, from how All you doing? About Android. Nice to meet you, Ron. Nice to see you. Ron is an expert in the in I believe in the topic you want to talk about. So give us give us your question. Well, a while back I was on the show and we were talking about uh, my Nexus. Uh, phone and how that's not a good place to store your plans for world domination <laughs> um, but the next I have an external USB one terabyte drive see if I'd plan this right I'd be stroking a kitty like a James Bond villain <laughs> or something but, uh, 
It's I'm okay. You're talk. allowed in Canada to have plans for world. Yeah, I, I was going to say, what are these plans, <laughs> and, and and should I be concerned? <laughs> Maybe it's just his shopping list. Yeah, it maybe. It, who knows? It doesn't yeah, it's matter. Just, it, it's just uh, accounting stuff. So you have you an know. external drive. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you want to keep the... You know, I, by the way, and I really love the... Uh, it's from... Um, is it Seagate, the T2? Um, I have this really amazing USB drive. I got it on Amazon. Uh, and uh, it's, it's two terabytes... And it has built-in encryption, which is really cool. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't work with Linux, but on Mac or PC, right. when you put the drive in, it says, well, if you want to see Leo's data, you need to enter the passphrase. You That's enter good. the passphrase, it unlocks it. That is a really great feature. Let me see if I can uh, find this. Uh, so at the manufacturer level, they're, they're yeah. applying. Yeah, know, but and, and it needs to, this is part of the problem. By the way, yeah. let me ask you, first of all, yes. did I misguide him when I said, don't put your plans for world domination no, on your Nexus? Phone? Not at all, no, yeah, that, okay. that's, a, that's a good advice. In fact, yeah, I would, <laughs> I, I would back it up to an encrypted drive. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because there is encryption on the Nexus phones, there's encryption on Android, um, but then again, I mean, you don't want to, I, I try not to keep anything 100% crucial on my device that I can drop in a nightclub. So, it's it's you know. encrypted by default, and most now uh, Android phones are yep. encrypted by default. Yep. And if they're not, all of them you can turn on encryption. Yep. Uh, the pr here's the reason I said it's something to be cautious about, is anytime you get encryption from a vendor, yep. What you don't know is what the vendor knows, what the vendor doesn't know. Is it, as Steve Gibson calls it, trust no one in the sense that only you hold the keys? If that's the case, then if the vendor gets a national security letter here in the U.S., I'm sure there's the equivalent in Canada, gets law enforcement saying, hey, give us what's on that. They just ask very politely. They yeah. say, can you please give us all your data? Yeah. You say, oh, I'm please. sorry, here you go. Uh, <laughs> but what we don't know is if Apple, Microsoft, or Google, or any of these companies uh, can see this stuff. So, yep. uh, and, and that's a little bit of an issue if what you're worried about is go governmental interference. You right. might also say, well, what if there's a rogue employee at Google who just wants to look for dirty pictures and he's going through all the backed up encrypted stuff on all these phones? Right. Do you know whether, this is my question, maybe you know, no. does Google have access to the passcode to unlock my Nexus phone? I have no idea. We don't know, do I, we? And I just assume that they do. If so, they don't say yeah. they don't, if they, here's how you tell, is there a password recovery mechanism? Right. If there is, well, guess what? Uh, if they don't explicitly say, hey, don't lose this key, because right. if you lose this key, you're, you're messed up. I just was recently reading an article by a hacker who's, there is apparently, didn't know this, but Apple has a way, if you forget your firmware co uh, lock code nope. on your Apple MacBook, and you go, oh, what do I do? You can go, there's actually a way, app, call Apple, and they'll say, okay, press and hold, command, shift, I can't remember the keys, like six keys, right? <laughs> Partially and it, and key reboot, <laughs> and it will generate a, a long code, and if you give us that code, we will create a firmware unlocker and we'll send yep. it to you. Yep. Well, if they can do that for you... They can do that for anybody. They can do that yeah. for anybody. So there are ways to encrypt external hard drives. What I would suggest is, your and, and BitLocker, that's something you mentioned in your question, that's from Microsoft. Yeah, Bit file lockers, vault, yeah. bitlocker, but you they're binary blobs and you they're not open source, you don't know what the company knows and doesn't know. I th I th yeah, I, I would recommend that you look for, I mean, BitLocker is great because my, it's a Microsoft product and a lot of people are using it. It's very d d uh, dependable, but that same kind of what are they doing and how it works. Um, if you want to look for an independent third party, look into Veracrypt. That's the one. Yeah. So yeah. TrueCrypt, we all for years recommended TrueCrypt. Yeah. Until a couple of years ago. <laughs> so, and if you listen to Security Now, this was fun. The guys on TrueCrypt unaccountably posted, uh, if you went to TrueCrypt.org, it said, oh, don't use TrueCrypt anymore. It's not safe. Yep. And bye. <laughs> <laughs> We're out. <laughs> We're out of here. <laughs> and furthermore, they yeah. modified TrueCrypt, the open source. It was kind of quasi open source. Yep. The quasi open source TrueCrypt. So if you download the latest version, it would break it. It would say, no, no, we're not going to do this anymore. Yeah. So people are still using older versions of TrueCrypt. In fact, Steve Gibson offers an old version of TrueCrypt. But even Steve is starting to say, and by the way, you can trust TrueCrypt because there was an audit. Yeah. Uh, there was a Kickstarter to raise money. They raised the money and they did an audit and they went through all the code. Yep. 
it, it was open source to the extent that you, they could look at the code, not open source to the extent that you could reuse the code, although people have. Mm -hmm. And they verified it and they said, yes, it's good. TrueCrypt, however, it's been a couple of years. Um, it's, it's still out there on SourceForge and things like that, but with huge warnings. So there have been a number of what we call forks, where they took the TrueCrypt source code mm -hmm. and did new versions. And Veracrypt... Yeah, this is this is this is the weird page on, on TrueCrypt.org where they said, "Don't use us; use Microsoft's BitLocker," <laughs> which which I frankly thought was weird. Yeah. Um, anyway, since they haven't developed since May 2014, Veracrypt has forked the code, and as best we can tell, it is good quality code. It is reliable. It doesn't have any government backdoors. It is open source, so you can verify it. It has not yet been audited. Right. Um, I suspect somebody will endeavor to do that. It turns out it's to be a complicated thing to do and, and, and time consuming and fairly costly. But uh, Steve Gibson and I and many others agree this for now yeah. is your best alternative because it's open source. We know there's no government backdoor. We know it's truly trust no one. And remember, that means if you encrypt a hard drive with Veracrypt and forget the passcode, all, you're done. That's gone, and that's good. <laughs> that's what you <laughs> yeah. want. Just don't forget the passcode. Do you know if that would work uh, with my Chromebook? Because I know BitLocker. I, I plugged it into my Chromebook, and it had no clue. No, oh, not, yeah. no. Clearly. Um, yeah. That's a really good question about encryption on Chrome OS. That's, I don't know about that. because right, So, yeah, so Veracrypt is mainly it Mac, all, Windows, yeah. and Linux. What but, you need uh, is a Chrome yeah. extension, a right. Chrome encryption extension. And let me just look and see who's making um, those. I'm sure there is one, and that's what you have to use, because a Chromebook means you have to use Chrome. So I see Quip, Quick Encrypt. Um, I, let's see. Mini Lock, Mini Lock is one. That's Mini pretty, Lock I'm yeah. aware of. Mini Lock uh, a lot is of people there. like Mini Lock. Yep. Um, let me see. So uh, I didn't know you had a crypto, Chromebook. Okay, CryptoCat, but that's for messaging. Yeah. Mail envelope is for email. Mini lock is from CryptoCat. Now the problem with CryptoCat, as I remember, is while it's using all the right technologies, I don't. Is it? It says it's audited. All right, peer-reviewed software. I don't know if it's actually open source, but if it's audited and peer-reviewed, that's a good sign. Yeah. Um, yeah, Mini Lock is probably. I the think way Mini to Lock's go. the way to go. Yeah. I think that. Yeah. If I if I was gonna if with the Chromebook, I would go Mini Lock. So. Good idea. I'm sorry that I kind of sprang that on you. I just no, but that, but that's important was, because that means yeah. you, if you're going to do it in a Chromebook, it has to be software. Either you're going to have to use yeah. Crouton and put Linux on there, or right. you're going to have to use software that runs in Chrome, which means it has to be a Chrome extension. Right. And there there aren't many choices. But MiniLock, I've heard very good things about. And you know, let let me ask Steve Gibson uh, if he's looked at that. I know he's recommended CryptoCat, the same yeah. company. Yeah. Um, it's my memory that CryptoCat is not open source, but I may be wrong on that. Um, however, if it has been audited and, you know, you can verify the auditing, the main thing is as long as nobody can unlock that except you, there's, if there's a password recovery, that's a red flag. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean it's not trust no one, but it's right. probably trust no, not trust no one. Mm -hmm. um, cool. yeah, yeah, mini lock. yeah, check out mini lock and let us know how, how, how it plays yeah, out. I'll investigate mm -hmm. that myself. Excellent. That's yeah. a very good question. And keep those shopping lists secure. Okay. Don't let anyone else get them. <laughs> I mean, world domination. <laughs> I mean, shopping yeah. list. Right. Yeah. Hey, it's great to talk to you. Thanks for joining us yeah. once again. All right. Take Thank care, you so Ed. Much. So, All right. All right. You too. Bye -bye. Next week, we got Frederick Van Johnson, our favorite cool. photographer, one of our favorites. There's so many. If you have a photography question, here's how you can ask it next week. Need tech help? The new screensavers are here with answers. Email your tech questions to newscreensavers at twit.tv. Thank you, Jim Cutler, the voice of Twit. He yes, is a great so voice. great. Don't you great love voice. Jim? Hey, we're going to relocate because we've got a virtual reality pinball game to play. While we're taking a walk, Tony Wang has a review of a new car seat, a new infant seat, Bluetooth enabled, called the Mama Roo. Take a look. <laughs> I'm Tony Wang for Twit.tv, and I'm here with something a little bit different than our usual mobile phone and laptop review. I got a chance to try out the Mamaru by 4Moms. I recently came in possession of a baby, and as I was shopping for the baby, the Mamaru was one of the first items that I came across on the internet. 
Mamaru is a Bluetooth-enabled infant seat that carries up to 25 pounds of baby. It's got a sleek and minimalistic design, and I like to think of it as the Tesla Model S of the infant seat world. The Mamaru comes in two parts: the base pedestal and the seat frame where your baby will be drooling. All the movements happen in the base, where you can choose from five unique motions and speed. There's also two speakers for playback of any audio devices, as well as built-in various sounds to choose from. There are lots of pattern and color options for the seat fabric, which is attached to the frame via zippers and is easily removed and machine washable. The mobile that dangles over the baby has three detachable paws, which will keep your baby entertained while they go for a ride on the seat. The paws are designed so one side is black and white and the other side is colored, and that's because depending on the age of your baby, they're attracted to different colors and patterns. I thought this was a nice, thoughtful touch. The companion app is available on iOS as well as Android. You have full control of the seat via the companion app, but there's also built-in controls on the base, so you can make adjustments there as well. The only downside I came across while using the Mamaru is the cost. The price more than twice as much as traditional infant seats with similar features. But just like a Tesla, you're paying for the latest and the greatest. Here's the deal: as a new parent. The most important thing for your newborn is safety, and with infinite adjustability and variable speed settings, you will not find another baby seat that is this feature-rich and fun to use, even for dads. I'm Tony Wayne for Twitter TV, and this has been the Mama Roo for dads. All right, we've taken a long walk back. Can you believe that he just recently just, came in possession? Of sometimes a baby. you just find a bit. You wake up and like there's a baby. Like he found it on the doorstep. Sometimes. Tony Wang. It. That's <laughs> weird. Okay. He's unique. We are back in Studio C. That's our Very green cool. screen studio. This is where we show off VR stuff. And joining us now, your pinball buddy. Yep, Jeremy Williams. Uh, how you doing, Jeremy? Good. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thanks and, for joining me. As I mentioned earlier, Jeremy's in my pinball league, and uh, that's hysterical. Became friends a couple of years ago. Found out he's a pretty amazing maker and hacker in his own right. You so. did a Kickstarter a couple of years ago, that's right? That's right. Yeah, I had a pixel frame. I have a pixel frame called uh, Game Frame, and it's uh, 16 by 16. Super successful on Kickstarter, and now that's what I do. I, I make neat. that. So that's become your full-time business. Uh, so far, I'm trying to. Yeah, I just relaunched it this year. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Ledsec dot com. Mm -hmm. yeah, very cool. But. As a pinball player, yes. you were very interested, I guess, when the Oculus Rift came out. They oh. have VR pinball games, right? That's true. No, I've been interested in the Oculus Rift since it was on Kickstarter. I was one of the first backers of the Kickstarter. Me too. Yeah. I um, now have two for some reason. but <laughs> so, so when they announced it, did you immediately think, ooh, I want to play pinball on that? Or? No, no. Yeah. I've actually been opposed to you know, a virtual pinball ever right. since it was on flat screen because yeah. you, can't, you can't play that in the same way that you can re sort of replay Pac-Man. Pac-Man makes sense right. emulated, but pinball emulated makes no sense. Pinball's really a physical sport where exactly. you're moving, that's, you're that's, tilting. You're right. That's one of the reasons why I like it is because... Body it, English. Yeah, because it's, it's physics and it's, you can, you, the way you manipulate the table affects the game. But also the way you perceive the ball. Yeah. It, you need to be able to move your head around. You know, nobody stays static when they play pinball. And yeah. All those oh, virtual pinball games, there's one yeah. camera in one, yeah. one yeah. position. But so being able to move your head around once you could finally do that in VR, that kind of made me think this might work. Okay. Yeah. So, so you think this might work, so Oculus comes out, mm -hmm. and then you, you put together this sucker. Well, yeah, I, I, I covered an Oculus event for, for Tested, where yeah. I was uh, fortunate enough to go, yeah. and uh, they unveiled this pinball game, and five seconds in, I knew that this yeah. needed a proper interface, because gamepad is okay, but right. uh, this once you add the this to it, it becomes a simulation. So to be clear, game. right now, if you have a Rift, you can buy pinball games and use yep. the gamepad that comes with the Rift right. to play the game. Right. But wouldn't it be better to have a dedicated pinball controller? Right. And because that, because for, for those who aren't familiar with pinball, because it is a, it's coming back. It, it was very, very People popular. People know what pinball is. Yeah, I, think some, I think there's I some, I think there's some youngins. There's some millennials out there. Francisco. There is, yeah, we're in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's very, it's very good. Yeah. But I mean, the, the key interface is that you've got the two flipper buttons on the side. You've got a plunger to, to launch the ball. Those and the start button. Those are the kind of main ones. Mm -hmm. um, were those easy to port to the controller? Well, with this one, um, it was, it was the bare basics. So yeah, it was a flipper. It was a launch button, kind of yeah. like you know, Attack from Mars style, and a start button, which gets you to the menus. Right. And a joystick up top to control the menus. Not which very hard to build. No, super easy. This was a trip to Walgreens for the foam core. Yeah. It took yeah. me a day to cut out and glue together. But we'd like something a little more robust that I can kind of really put some body this English into. This has the weight of a, of a yeah. feather. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. so that's why I went to wood and with the assistance of a friend of mine, Christopher. Okay. And here we go. We remade it. He's got wood, all right. You even have this real pinball legs on this thing. 
But it's a little truncated because, of course, the rest of the game is in the it's VR. In, that's right. So this is oh, a, a perfectly scale representation of the first eight inches of a pinball machine. <laughs> how, per how perfect? Is it perfect? It's, it's perfect. all you need! <laughs> it, 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 it needs to be perfect, right? Yeah, right. The joystick. It does. <laughs> I don't even remember a joystick on a pinball game. They have no, that's joystick. for the no. menus. That's yeah. Oh, that's for menus. So, all right. Same with the arcade buttons up top. This this could potentially be used for arcade you games. You know what I love, though? You've got a real plunger. Well, and that was a and challenge, it's spring wasn't it? loaded. The Look at that. plunger was probably the biggest technical challenge. Uh, yeah. It, do you want to open it up yet? or? Ron, why don't you play? Because no, you're a professional. I play pinball all the time. I want to see you do this. Really? I'll take your cards. Yeah. Can I play? Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah let's All see right. you do it. I, I think All it's right. more amusing to watch Leo try to play VR pinball. Okay. No, I'm excited. All right. So w one of the reasons we do this in a green screen is so you can see what I'm seeing. Yep. I'm look now, there's more than one game, right? This is just That's Mars. Right. Okay. So, yeah, so this is using VR pinball, right? It, yeah, the game is called Pinball FX2 VR, okay. and it, it comes with these three games that they ported to VR from their catalog. It's a, this is a pinball, a digital pinball The company. flippers work. The plunger works. Oh, yep. this is very real. And it has an accelerometer in it, so you can nudge it. I can tilt it? Yeah. Yeah, and no. it's, a, it's analog, so whichever direction you push is Wait a minute, the direction there's, it goes there's in. like spiders and weird things. Well, oh, the, yeah, that's the, the game. ball so saver so saved it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, that, that was cool. one of my big, big things was that, you know, with, with, oh. one of the complaints with virtual pinball playing, you know, and uh, a tablet app or anything like that is that the physics is a, a big challenge. Right. And so you want to actually be able to move the, the controller and have that affect the game, and you're, you figure that out. I'm not going to say this replaces real pinball, but it yeah. is the closest thing yet. Like, if it's coming around the orbit, yeah. if you slap the side of the game, the ball will go out, you know, off of the slingshot. This is very, oh, it's very fun. And the thing is, this there's no latency, the response time, and I'm well, sure that's part of it. Well, isn't part, it that was actually an interesting challenge because initially I had to use this middleman software that converted uh, what was direct input to X input, and that this adds a little bit of latency to it. So, I, but I met this guy on GitHub named Zachary Littell who wrote an X input library for the Teensy processor that I used. Okay. So now the computer just thinks it's a gamepad. And so, you know, it's not disorienting like a lot of uh, Oculus Rift games are. Right. You just really feel like you're in a pinball arcade playing the game. I think the biggest challenge, at least when we were playing before the show started, was once you put the Oculus headset on is actually getting to the uh, buttons safely. Well, right. once you, once you learn. <laughs> yeah. Because you yeah, can't see it. You unlike, can't see, yeah. Unlike, with some Oculus Rift games, whoa, yeah. you have, this is real, but this right. isn't real. This Although, it feels very good, and I guess that's the advantage of actually making a case with wood and everything. Yeah. This is solid. Yeah. So now, are you are you going to start manufacturing these? No, no, I open sourced it, so all the okay. plans are online. It's posted on tested.com. The okay. code is on GitHub. Um, you just need a TNC and you flash it. It's really easy. Right. And all the, the plans are really simple, especially for the phone core version. Honestly, it's like under $100, and it's not that much time. Do you want to open it up and check out the... Absolutely. Oh, there's there's the more hood? in yeah, here? Let's, oh. let's see it. Yeah, uh, let's yeah. See. Of course there is. Yeah. So, oh, this is really nicely done. Look at the, this. It's so beautiful. I 3D printed the uh, rumble holders. Um, the, really, the challenging part was the plunger, and it's probably a lot of work for minimal payoff, to be honest with you. Because <laughs> but it's that authenticity. It, is, it makes yeah. it look so much better, and yeah. you can hit those skill shots. Yeah. But So I 3D printed these two components. It holds an IR distance detector, okay. and it, oh, measures, it measures the distance. <laughs> oh, you're disc. kidding. <laughs> Oh, and that is great. With the help of some mathematicians, I was able to, you know, get the right formula so it's linear, so it really maps correctly. I just like how casually you say, with the help of some mathematicians, oh I was able to get the formula. Like, like, <laughs> what I mean is oh Twitter.com, like sure. with, the, yeah. with the help of, of Twitter. <laughs> this um, is amazing. Yeah, so I made the circuit board, plugs everything together, and... Um, how much would it cost uh, for somebody using your plans to put this together? This? What's the range? This obviously is a little bit higher. In right? parts, this is probably about $400. Not bad. No. Not um, bad. Yeah. Yeah. Especially consider, and considering that a, if you wanted to buy a pinball machine, Thousands. that's that's could be average about five thousand dollars. Yeah, for a new and one, for one or game, or even even a nineties machine, the right machine, five thousand yeah, bucks, no exactly. problem. Exactly, and that's just one game. At least with this, you could get a library of games that you can play with the with the controller. Potentially, yeah. Potentially. yeah. Pinball yeah. Arcade is supposed to be releasing a VR version of their games, including yeah. like Ghostbusters. And this like, would work with yeah. any Oculus pinball. It game. It works with any pinball game because they all work with the same controller. That's right. right. But it also works with any any PC pinball game because oh. it really is a gamepad. Oh, so, so it doesn't even need to be you VR. You don't even need a VR oh. headset. Oh, okay. you could just be in front of a monitor. With, yeah, you know, yeah, but it's really thing. fun with a VR headset. It's so fun. Yeah, that is so cool. It's very immersive in that. Uh, Jeremy Williams, you could find more at ledseq.com. That's his business. And where are the pa the uh, uh, patterns for this? Uh, Tested.com. If you if you Google pin sim right now, it's the first three results you'll pin see. Sim. It. Pin, pin sim. P i n s i n. Yeah. This is amazing. Thanks, Leo. But you are obsessive. Yes. Crazy obsessive. I mean, just the 
Oh yeah, we gotta get the mathematics so it's a linear well, scale. Right. But, but that's the thing the... is that it, it, pinball pinball players and pinball fans, if anything, care. are are pedantic. What? And we know pedantic. We know has the response a little... been good. I mean, the serious pinball players. Are... Yeah, I'm actually really kind of surprised yeah. uh, because there've been virtual pinball games for a while, flat right. flat screen yeah. and TVs. They, laugh, they mock. Yeah. And you know, but just playing it in VR, I think, is a completely different experience. I could honestly see this kind of thing affecting actual pinball game it was sales. Fun. Yeah. It was you know, really I think fun. So, yeah. You played it? I played it. Yeah, yeah. It's fun. Like it? yeah, yeah. It's fun. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, really yeah. awesome. So, didn't make Jeremy. my play any better. That's my own fault. I thought I was yeah. playing pretty well, but anyway, thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah. I really you, appreciate it. A yeah. lot of fun. The pin sim, P I N S I M. Google yep. it. You'll find out more. Now we're going to take another walk, and while we do, Chris Markwart, my favorite photographer, my other favorite photographer, right, I have a lot of them, <laughs> is going to tell us how to avoid taking ugly pictures of people like me. Multiple Hello, it's a photo tip with Chris Marquardt. You can find out more about me at tipsfromthetopfloor.com or at discoverthetopfloor.com. I want to talk about taking pictures of people and especially like people around you or close to you who, who you can talk to openly. Um, ask them what they don't like about themselves. There are there are lots of different areas, especially in the face, that are kind of, you know, some people don't like their nose or their eyes. Um, I want to talk about the chin. It's really easy to avoid having like a chin that comes out like this. Um, have the subject bring their head slightly forward. Shoot from slightly above the eye line and that make the chin area so much more pleasing. That was it. Back to Studio A. His pictures are so good, and he acts like, oh, yeah, all you got to do is have people look up or look... No, no, no. no. you got to be a great photographer. <laughs> he does... His people pictures really are impressive. Right. Thank you, Chris. Chris Marquardt, he's a regular on uh, The Tech Guy Show. He's our regular cool. photo guy. And uh, you can tune in and hear him on... I guess he's on every Sunday at about 12.30 Pacific, 3.30 Eastern on The Tech Guy Show. Are you ready for the mailbag? Let's do it. Let's bring it on. Fire when ready, Gridley. <laughs> you, are you nervous about hurting me? I think, that's, I think that's what it is. All right. All right. Two questions. I'll let you pick one. So yeah. So we, we go this one. We pull. We I, I told everyone all about Android. I post on Twitter. I said if you had any your Android questions, oh, let's do them. So uh, this first one comes from another Ron. Uh, it comes from Ron from Morris Hill, Indiana. I always love when we get other Rons. Uh, he says I have a question about default applications after the Marshmallow update. I have a Samsung Note 4, which I've had from day one, and since the Marshmallow update, it's made this good phone a great phone, except for one change that bothers me. I'm trying to understand if this is a Samsung thing or a Marshmallow thing. Prior to the Marshmallow update, I was, not, I was able to not have a default application for certain programs. For instance, sometimes I use the Samsung browser, sometimes I use yeah, the Chrome browser, and other times thing. I use the yeah, Link browser. Yeah. I like the ability to choose a different browser when I want, uh, that I want without it becoming the default. If I didn't check the box, I'd always get the opportunity to choose between multiple browsers. After the Marshmallow update, that has been removed. Once you click a browser, it becomes the default. Yep. So my question is, do you have a workaround for this? I'm hoping Android isn't moving in the direction of the iPhone, which makes all the decisions for you. I love Android and the way you can customize it and personalize it your own preferences. So, uh, Ron, I have good news. Well, first off, if you go in the settings and then tap on apps, you can change your default uh, applications. Right. So, if it's set to a the Samsung browser well, or a see, different he browser, he wants that menu to choose exactly. every single time. Exactly. There and there is a solution. As oh. a, a Android, there's always that a is a new Marshmallow yes. feature, though. Yep. It just says when you pick that, it says it doesn't even say you want me to make this default. You just right. have a checkbox. Now it says, okay, it's your default. If you want to change it, go into the apps. And and that thing, you you have the control to change the default, so you, you you're, it's not making the decision for you. But how do I get that menu every time? There is an app called uh, what's the name of it? It is called. Uh, um, better open with ah. and better open with replaces the function that opens apps when you click right. on a link and gives you that choice that you want. You can choose from a list of browsers. Uh, you can choose from whatever client you might want or what uh, whatnot. So better open with is your answer. Install this. This will solve all your problems. People often ask why we sometimes, I prefer Android. Yeah. You obviously prefer Android yeah. over iPhone. And it really comes down to this. And it's not for everybody, but Android is, is architected openly. Yep. And so in almost every case, you can modify how a, a developer can modify how Android behaves. Exactly. If you don't like the way something works, Five Bucks says there's a developer out there who yeah. agrees with you and has made a workaround or made an app that does it. And as we've seen, as Android as an operating system has evolved, Google is paying attention and seeing what people are using. And we've seen a lot of these third-party developer concepts get folded into the operating system. But there's so. almost always a way back, which I yeah. really, really like. Yeah. And of course, the trade-off is security. Yes. Uh, because Apple locks everything down, it means there's a lot of things you can't configure. On the other hand, 
malware can't configure them either, right. so you're a little more safe, and it's a little simpler. And I think uh, Apple's attitude has been since 1984 when they came out the Macintosh. Now, we're going to tell you the right way, the best way to do it, and that's how you're going to do it, and life will be simpler. You don't want all these options. Right. And for a lot of people, that's absolutely true. Right. For geeks like us, we want to tweak the thing like it's, crazy. I look at it like a control issue. There are certain areas yeah. that are important to me. I want to control them. There are certain areas I don't want to think about. And Android lets you, do, you know, pick and choose that. Well, so. here's one from Trey that is clearly in that camp. Yep. Longtime listener to so many of the Twitch shows. Thanks for what you guys do. Well, thank you for listening. If we didn't have listeners, we couldn't do what we do. And yeah. We love doing what we do. I had an LG G3 phone. So this is a pretty old one. It was yep. rooted, had a custom recovery. He was using Twerp. Just got a 6P. Loving it. Most of the reason I wanted to flash other ROMs is because I wanted something closer to stock Android, but now, of course, that's what I have with yep. the 6P. Is having Twerp the best way to back up my current stock ROM, or are there tools there for this, since this phone is set for deve developers, I think, already? So, Twerp, which uh, I can't remember what it stands for. I the, I don't remember what it's it is. It's a recovery <laughs> uh, uh, tool. It's really what happened. So... Let's step it, take a step yeah. back. So uh, all phones, including the 6P, come with a, a recovery yep. boot manager that if something goes wrong, you can press the volume down and the and on button, button yeah. and it'll load up and you can reinstall the operating system. You right. can wipe the data or the memory and that, that kind of thing. Right. All Android phones come with it. Usually the manufacturer provides it. Samsung has theirs. Google has theirs. Yeah. Twerp is a third-party recovery utility. That First of all, you have to be rooted to change to yeah. put this on. Okay, So you have to have root access to your phone. And then once you put Twerp on, you can put other tools on, including boot managers like ROM right. manager that will let you say, oh, today I want to be cyanogen. Right. Tomorrow I'd like to be something else. And every day you can have a different operating system. And, al and also allows you go in the other direction to back up your ROM settings. So once you've got your phone set perfectly the way you want it, and this is my back ROM, it up. back it up so I have it so that let's say a OS update rolls out and it screws up your settings, right. you want to go back to what you had. So it's like an image copy exactly. of yeah. your phone exactly as it is. Exactly. But do you have to have Twerp to do that? Well, if you're already using Twerp, then like you've you're already you know what you're doing. But he doesn't, so I would say I, I, he I, doesn't want to. Well, first of all, yeah. can you root your six P? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you can without violating any rules, right? Because you know, right. in Samsung, for instance, if you do this, yeah. they don't like it because no. it means their Knox security platform is now in an unknown state. Yeah. You won't be able to play back certain movies like Netflix. Right. You you even they even have this counter that that will actually lock your phone after a period yeah. of time. But but Google doesn't do anything. No, of those Google things. doesn't. I mean, I would actually say stick with Twerp. Um, I assume you're using something like an Android or something like that, which is for an interface. the imaging. For, yeah, for the imaging that sort of thing. The other thing, if you want to try something else, is uh, check out Clockwork Mod. Um, which Love cl Clockwork Mod. Yeah, and Clockwork Mod basically does the same thing as Twerp. They're almost yeah. interchangeable. Yeah. Um, but it, it uh, Clockwork Mod, I find, is a little more elegant in terms of how it handles stuff. And it has a lot of stuff that Android does um, uh, kind of bu built into it. Uh, so Clockwork Mod is, is I've used amazing. their ROM, man yeah. ROM manager forever. Yeah. And, uh, in fact, uh, Twerp came after, I think, yeah. Clockwork Mod. But yeah. uh, So some people prefer it. It's really a matter of taste. Yep. I agree with you. I like Clockwork Mod. And yeah. I think the guys behind that are very, very good developers. Oh, yeah. Oh, some of the best, yeah. yeah. I mean, Visor and Allcast and stuff yeah. like that. It's amaz amazing. And they did, stuff, they did yeah. Helium, which yeah. was yeah. a backup utility that does no, no longer requires rooting. Right. And that's an excellent... Uh, yeah. uh, but that's not yeah. the same thing. That's not the same thing. Yeah, that's that. That's just this is just uh, syncing your apps and backing up your data. Right. Uh, the the actual ROM Doesn't level. Doesn't back up your setup. Little, exactly. But the thing is that as the Android platform has evolved, the need to uh, the need to go to the ROM level and root and get root access is becoming less and less. Yeah. A lot of the functionality that you got by being able to access the ROM and and get root access, you can now do just in the operating system alone. And right. so the, the need to do that is minimal. So. Yeah, sometimes yeah. I think we bring old habits with us. Yes. Yep. And the old habit, of course, was to have Twerp on there, so you had control. But now with, uh, with the way Google's handling stock Android, yeah. you, it's, it's pretty flexible. Old habits know? die hard, like headphone jacks. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Those will never die. One last bonus question, because somebody, <laughs> a lot of people were asking about this. This is what I got from my dad for Father's Day, and cool. I, I brought it out. It's kind of cool. It's a globe that's floating, and of course, there's some science in this, because the globe floats. It's literally not touching the top. How is it suspended in the middle? And a number of you have figured out there's two densities of liquid 
in here. Oh. Which may, yeah, it's clever. But then the other thing that's really wild is when it's in light, it rotates. And it, by the way, it always rotates from east to west as the Earth does. And it should, even if, it, if you flipped it over and it went the wrong way, that wouldn't be a good thing. But no, right. in fact, it handles it perfectly. Does, so, it, does it rotate the same direction if we're in Australia? Yes. Oh, yeah, would, yeah. Well, that's a good question. Because right, the water goes in the other direction. Right? No, that's not true. But. <laughs> But it does use uh, essentially a compass yeah, to know yeah. which way to go. Right. It, it measures a magnetic field. Yeah. Um, it's magic. It's very cool. But they wondered where I got it. It was MOVA, M-O-V-A International. Uh, and there it is. And it's expensive. This was uh, $300 for this. They make a variety of them. I know. It's, it's pre well, it was for my dad. Well, yeah. So it's a cool game. And, I, and you see, I got the one with satellite. But you can also get uh, the uh, Cassini version. You can get a blue, you know, traditional blue globe. That antique one, the first one looks nice. Don't That's you cool. like that? Yeah, I, maybe I should have cool. gotten that for him. Yeah. And then they also, if you look around, they have uh, in there, they have less expensive ones. I think the least expensive is around $100. It's not in a cube like this. Uh, it, is, uh, it is standing on um, a stand. Oh, cool. Still in liquid. And it still rotates, which might even be more magical. Wow. Um, yeah. Science. Yeah, crazy. science. Yeah. So those are that's as little as 135 bucks, which is probably a better way to go yeah. than three. <laughs> it's a cool gift, though. It's very cool. I thought my dad, you know, yeah. my dad's a geologist. Yeah. It's not rotating. I was wrong. Well, we stopped. <laughs> I broke it. I broke. I broke the earth. Have you noticed the sun is not moving in the sky anymore? <laughs> I'm worried. <laughs> These people have. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't it be funny if that actually were yeah. a real planet and I just was keeping it there? <laughs> sure did. You know, so it's all a simulation. The, Anything you want. The bottle get. city of Candor. <laughs> sorry. That's right. Sorry, yeah, sorry. That's right. Yeah, I just, I can't, that's it. Superman. I, I can't stop it sometimes. I, that's where I got the idea <laughs> yeah, from. No. no, that's exactly where I got the idea from. Yep. That's Ron Richards. Yep. He's not only a comic book nerd, yep. but he is also the host of All About Android and one of our favorite people. You find him at ifanboy.com on Twitter yep. at RonXO. Yep. Come back. You're oh, always absolutely. fun to do the show absolutely. with. And I love the Android knowledge. And yeah, the, the I love Google Android knowledge. too. I love being here every Tuesday, 5.30 with Jason and Flo. And uh, yeah, follow me on Twitter. And I often tweet about my pinball exploits. So you can see uh, I have what no the idea latest. you were yeah. in a league. Yep. Yeah. It's a lot, a lot of fun. Do you have fun. special shoes? No special shoes. Do you no. have special gloves? No special gloves. Just we have we have our hoodies, we have t-shirts, lots of beer. And, uh, oh, yeah. beer. Yeah, there's a lot uh, of beer. It's really yeah. a beer drinking. Yeah, it's really it's a lot a side, of beer. Yeah. A side. <laughs> But it feels like you should have special gloves. Yeah, it's fun, no, but there's a whole. I'm I'm a I'm ranked. I'm, I'm what? I'm, there's a whole ranking system. I'm the I'm one thousand five hundred thirty fifth in the world. I think right now. Yeah. So this guy's a pro. Not I'm really, glad you no, told me yeah, before yeah. I challenged yeah. you <laughs> to a match. Yeah. Holy! It's yeah. fun stuff. I like it. So. All right. Well, thank you, Ron. Come thank back you, anytime. Yeah. Next week, I, as I mentioned, uh, Frederick Van Johnson will talk about photography, and we've got a lot of geeky stuff to talk about. I'm so glad you joined us. We do this show every Saturday afternoon, 3 p.m. Pacific, if you want to watch live. That's 6 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC. You can join us in the chat room, too, irc.twit.tv. Be part of the kids in the back of the class. If you want to be in studio, we love having an in-studio audience. What we didn't understand, and you know... Traffic's terrible on Saturday coming to Petaluma. You're not alone. Everybody's coming up this way. Yeah. So uh, I think I should warn you, we'd love to have you. Leave early. Tickets at twit.tv. We'll put a seat out for you. And it's usually easy to get in because nobody wants to make that horrible drive. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, we're no, glad we're everybody's saying, everybody's we're saying San Francisco could really use a bridge to go north that's not a tourist landmark <laughs> because it's... Gets, Is that where it gets bad, the Golden well, Gate Bridge? It's, yeah, it's I mainly like getting out of the city and getting over the bridge. Oh, and but then, it's so yeah. pretty. Yeah, it is pretty. It's nice. It's yeah, so beautiful. <laughs> All right. Uh, I guess that's it. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on the new screensavers. Bye-bye.